afternoon, everyone. This is uh, the Jasmine Ballroom, and we're in here for Adaptive Kernel Live Patching, an open collaborative effort to ameliorate Android end day root exploits. Um, before we begin, a few notes. Uh, the business hall is located in Bayside AB during the day, and the welcome reception is from 5.30 to 7 tonight. Black Hat Arsenal is on the Palm Foyer on level three. Um, Joan is for the Pony Awards in Mandalay Bay BCD at 6.30. And uh, thank everyone to put their phones on vibrate uh, during the during the presentation. So, without further ado, um, Yolong Zhang and Tao Wei. Thank you, and um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Tao, and this is Yolong. Today, we will present our work on adaptive kernel like matching for Android. And today I will discuss the problem and the challenges, and then you know, we will provide a solution and discuss about the future. And first, let me introduce a little background for the people not in the system security area. And the kernel vulnerabilities are one of the most important threats for Android users. And by exploiting those kernel vulnerabilities, attackers can get sensitive information from the kernel or escalate the privilege to root the phone. After rooting the phone, attackers can break most of the security mechanisms for Android, such as access control, payment, security, key store, and so on. In the Android ecosystem, to mitigate this challenge, Android ecosystem deploy a trust zone. However, even trust zone will also be threatened after being rooted, because the trust zone cannot validate the kernel inputs, cannot validate the kernel input sources. And hence, the trust zone cannot tell the difference between you know, the benign inputs or malicious inputs, so that attackers can try to um, provide some fake inputs to um, make the trust zone to make wrong decisions. Um, so the, the, today, the uh, only way to mitigate these changes is to put all those dirty works in the trust zone itself, such as UI or networking and so on. But uh, this solution will increase the attacker service in trust zone dramatically, and it, it will bring more. In, it will introduce more and more vulnerabilities in trust zone itself. So this is it is a hard work. And this is a graph for monthly disclosed kernel vulnerabilities. As you can see, it is increased very fast. And this growing trend is bring us one good news and one bad news. The good news is that more and more attentions are drawn to skilled kernel. But the bad news is that the underground business, they have more and more vulnerabilities to exploit. And here are the list of uh, many vulnerabilities having public available exploits. And it's, uh, exploits itself is, uh, is, uh, is nurture, is uh, not bad or malicious, but uh, there are many malware. They are using those exploits to do bad things, such as merge, reported by Fry, and uh, Ghost Push, report, reported by CMCM, and uh, Dog specters and uh, hung back bodies by blue code. Uh, as you can see, kernel vulnerabilities for Android devices are real severe threats today. So let's ask a question. Uh, in fact, this is a very common question. Ask, uh, many people ask me about this question. Why is iOS more secure than Android? It's because iOS has fewer kernel vulnerabilities this is a graph of uh, the stats of uh, iOS vulnerabilities and Android. As you can see, in, in most of the time, iOS have, have more kernel vulnerabilities than Android. But people still think Android is uh, you know, not, not good, not better than iOS. What's the issue? So the problem is that, uh, the problem is not Android has more vulnerabilities than iOS, but Android vulnerabilities remain unfixed over a much, much longer time than iOS. Um, so what's the, what's the issue? Um, if Apple wants to patch a vulnerability, it will be done in, very, in a very, very timely manner. 
because uh, Apple controls the, the entire sub supply chain and Apple has the source code and uh, Apple forces a one direction upgrade. You can only upgrade to the latest version. So on the, all the iOS users will be sometimes forced to upgrade the latest version very, very soon. But for Android users, it is a lot of story. Um, for, Android, uh, for Android users, uh, there are three main causes to you know, delay the patch, the, the patching. The first one is about the long uh, patching chain. And the second is about the fragmentation. And the third one is the capability mismatching. I will explain them in more detail next. The first one, the long patching chain. As you can see, there are five steps before the patch can be uh, deployed. The first one is about the researchers. Uh, most of um, responsible researchers will disclose the vulnerabilities to the vendors, the different vendors such as Google, Qualcomm, or the phone vendors. But uh, there are also exploits appeared in public but never officially reported to the vendors. Um, last year, a paper, a CCS paper by Professor Chen reported such a phenomenon. They identified at least 10 device driver exploits that uh, were reported to uh, vendors. The second step, the, uh, after being reported, uh, after the business uh, reported to the hardware vendors or Google, um, there are still some exploits disclosed, but not getting timely patches. Here is a blog by Patrick Zizo from Google. And it uh, disclosed that uh, one patch was not applied to the bunches after being available for six months. Okay, the third one is about the uh, carriers. And sometimes phone vendor provide uh, patches, but uh, um, carriers delay or deny the, the patching. And this uh, is another report. And uh, the the carrier, you know, sometimes they even decline to do the work and never release the patches. So the last step, the you know, many users delay the OTA due to the rebooting. So there are there are issues in every step. Okay, the second change is the fragmentation. Here is the graph for the Android fragmentation. It's very very you know severe for vendor itself or for security researchers. Um, to simplify, we can see a much simpler problem is that the version fragmentation. As you can see, there's still a lot of old versions for in the real world devices today. And in some local markets, it is even worse. This is the stats for Chinese markets. There are still more than 40% of devices are older than 4.4. Okay, and the third one is the capability mismatching. And for vendor, for, in fact, phone vendors have the, you know, the best position to patch those uh, uh, vulnerabilities. However, they are, uh, most of the time, um, they don't have enough uh, resource to discover and patch those vulnerabilities. Especially after one or one year or one and a half year, the original, you know, the original de um, developing team, a lot of use exist and more. So no one care about the, the old phones. But for the security vendors, they, they, they are capable to, to do those uh, you know, security work and uh, they want to, um, to join the, the first to protect the users. However, they are not privileged enough. And without source code, and uh, it is very hard for them to handle all those fragmentations. So today, the situation is that the phone vendors don't have enough uh, resource, and the security vendors don't have the privileges, and Google try, have tried his, his best. Okay, uh, let, let's do some case studies. And this one, Tau Root, is very, very famous for Android uh, area. It's, it is uh, disclosed uh, two years ago, and uh, 
the ping pong route is disclosed um, one year ago, and the, the 1805 is disclosed this year. As you can see, uh, as you can see, the tau route has been disclosed. Uh, yeah, almost uh, 800 days. Yeah, so, but there are still more than 20% device can be routed by tau route. So this is very severe. Okay, so so we are facing such a, you know severe changes. So how can we secure them? All the pay systems. Uh, in, in fact, we all the security teams from you know from different vendors, from software vendors, from uh, phone vendors, from Google. We are working hard to secure the the Android ecosystem. But it is but due to the you know the fundamental issue, because uh, attackers can get the root root bridge very easily. So it, it is very, very hard for us to do this work very, very in, in a, in a you know, efficient way. Okay, that you don't want to introduce the solution. Thanks, thanks. So as thanks so said, the situation is quite bad. Um, so we proposed two solutions to uh, tackle this problem. Uh, we call them Adapt K-Patch, and another one is Lua K-Patch, which is even better. Essentially, they are kernel knife patching, but we do more than kernel knife patching. We can do auto adaption. So kernel knife patching is not a new idea. So we can see there, there have been a lot of solutions out there for many years, like K-Patch for Red Hat, uh, K-Graft, K-Splice, I think it's from Suzy. And even Linux upstream has the live patching uh, mechanism, uh, which is called live patch. So to use K-Graft as, as an example, so in the kernel, if there is a vulnerable function, they will use a new function to replace the old one and hook the uh, invocations to, towards the new one. In this way, the invocations to the buggy function will instead call into the fixed function. So all of the live patching, the current live patching mechanisms follow this uh, algorithm. So first, they will load new function into the memory and make it like, accessible by the other kernel code. And then it will like do the safety check. It, sometimes it will do, try to stop the world and see whether the stack contains the old function. So if the stack contains the old function, it will not try to replace it because it's pretty dangerous to have two copies of the functions, one old and one new, uh, in the same core stack. That's different context. So if they can check that there's a clean stack and no calling to the old function, they will try to replace, to, to hook the old function to the new function. So although we have so many uh, choices out there, uh, we still have some challenges uh, that stop the world to use like patching to fix all the problems that Langs have just described. Well, the first one is that most of the e existing work requires source code. So how do they achieve the live patching? They use two copies of the source code. One is vulnerable and one is fixed one. Uh, they, compa they compile two copies of the binaries and, compare and generate the diff. And they use the diff as the new function to apply to the function, uh, to the kernel. But the assumption is they have to have the kernel source code. Imagine that for a third party, if they want to, want to pass the vulnerability, how can they access a, the exact copy of source code of every phone? That's challenging. Even if they have the exact source code, they cannot just apply your patch for one phone to another phone. Because if you compile kernel module, for, for example, uh, to, for one certain phone, you cannot just load the same module to other phone uh, the kernel build. So here is how we solve this problem. We call this uh, new uh, framework as Adapt K Patch. Uh, basically, we have three steps. The first one is to collect kernel information and prepare a patch template uh, for each bug. And then we fill this uh, connected kernel information into the template to generate an adapted patch. And after the generating the adapted patch, we will uh, inject the payload, the patch payload into the kernel memory uh, for the patchwork. We have two choices. The first one is to uh, load a kernel module, and the second one is to uh, write to the KMAM or MAM device. We will talk about this in detail later. And after loading this patch payload into the memory 
the rest of the thing is the same as other patching mechanisms, like in-place hooking, uh, in-place modification, or hook the invocations. So let's dig into each step in detail. Uh, the first step is kernel info information gathering. We collect some information, including the kernel version, the ver magic, uh, the, uh, the kernel module CRC, uh, et cetera. We collect such kind of information uh, just to make the module fit, uh, adapted to the target platform. Uh, sometimes we can collect this information from the kernel memory, and sometimes if we, if we have in, enough, uh, we have root, we can directly extract the boot image and get the kernel for analysis and obtain the information. And the second step is uh, to inject the patching payload into the kernel memory. We, as we said, we have two choices. The first one is to load module into the kernel, and the second one is directly write the binary ex executable into the memory. Uh, we did a, a statistic, statistics in a Chinese market and found that 95% of the devices have insmod function. Uh, and 60% of the devices have KMAM device. So that's added up to 99.4% of the devices. So which means the majority of the devices can be fixed by combining these two methods. For the first choice, the kernel module injection, uh, we will pre prepare a kernel module template for each bug. So for example, tower root, we'll have a like, template, module template to fix this uh, vulnerability. But for this template, we leave some uh, field as blank that should be filled in later when we do the adaption. So some field include uh, the ver magic, the symbol CRC, and et cetera. So here, here are an example of the, uh, the header of the kernel module. So we will prepare the empty uh, buffer and later fill the collected information into the module. So after we do this adjustment, the kernel module can be loaded into the target platform. But that's not end of, an end of the story. On some platforms, uh, there are further check. For example, on Samsung devices, they will check whether the, the module has been properly signed by Samsung's private key. So in that case, if you want to load a uh, adjusted uh, kernel module, we have to pass the kernel to just uh, not valid validate the uh, kernel signature. But after loading our patching uh, module, we have to patch it back for security reason. The second choice is to do the uh, MAM or KMAM injection. So that's similar. We prepare, uh, we prepare a, a struct that has uh, empty fields as a template. And after collecting enough kernel information, we fill such information into the template. And then we can do the, such, do the uh, binary executable injection to execute it on the target platform. So in this way, if, the, uh, if there is any uh, dependency in the code, uh, it can be automatically solved. For example, if it has to call VM, VM, VM allo uh, symbol, we can just search the symbol and fill this into the uh, structure. So after these two, uh, two choices, we can uh, adapt the patch and inject it into the memory, and then we can do the same thing as other kernel-like patching uh, choices. We do, for example, we can do override the kernel function pointer to redirect the invocations to the uh, new function, or we can just override the patch code directly in place. And also we can do like inline hook to, 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 to change the invocation to the new function. Overall, our procedure looks like this. For each vulnerability, we have a patch template. And after we collect the target device information, we can adjust the template into an adapted patch with this adapted patch, we can load it into the target platform and do the patch work. So the challenges we described earlier can be well solved. So for example, we don't need source code anymore. We just, just prepare a template, binary template, and then we can collect the needed information, information for you, and it will fill the information for you, so you have an adapted patch afterwards. And in this way, you can also, you don't have to worry about like adapting anymore. Like you can generate a template for one device, and we can do the adaption for you. You can load it to directly into other devices. So imagine that right now the pie chart look like, looks like the left one. 
with our adapted like kernel net patching work, uh, it can look like, looks like the right one. We have successfully evaluated this framework on many existing famous CBEs. So we listed here, and you can see that many of the uh, famous routes can be uh, tackled, like farmer route, tower route, ping pong route, and the recent uh, 1805 uh, pipe route. We have tested this framework on many famous platforms, like Samsung devices, Huawei devices, HTC devices, the novel ones, and in fact, we have tested on almost all the well-known vendors. Uh, if you have the phone that are not listed on these slides, you can contact us. And here is a quick demo. So we got a cool pad Android phone here, which is one of the famous Chinese Android phones. So sorry for the Chinese encodings. Uh, the user is trying to see what's the uh, version number of this phone. Uh, it, it displays as Android 4.4.4, .4, which is quite old device. Of course, it has many uh, vulnerabilities that can, that can be explo exploited to get root. And we use the King Root, one, one of the um, top root vendors in China, to root the phone. So it tried to scan the phone for vulnerabilities. And it found that the phone can, is rootable right now. And actually, it tried to root the phone using ping pong root. And you can see that it successfully root the phone. For comparison, we undo the root by uninstall, uninstall this app and reboot the device. After rebooting, we will use Baidu's uh, uh, live patching framework that we just described to fix the vulnerabilities. So you can see right now we launched the uh, Baidu uh, kernel adaptive uh, live patching framework, and it scans how many uh, vulnerabilities exist on the device. And you can see that there are five uh, kernel vulnerabilities exists right now. So we do the one click uh, fixing. And, and you can see that all the vulnerabilities have been fixed. So right now, if we install the king root again and do the root work, it should fail because there's no exploit exploitable vulnerabilities anymore. Here is, again, it scans for uh, exploitable vulnerabilities. It will, it will eventually fail after all the attempts. You may think this is slow, but we have actually fast forwarded it actually tries a long time, try to find all the possible root exploits. And then it draws the conclusion that it cannot be rooted. So here, this is the demo that we fix the vulnerabilities use adapt the K patch. Uh, but this solution can be further improved. Uh, recall the two problems the long patching uh, chain, which we have already solved. Because after researchers found the vulnerability, it does, it does not require the long patching chain to be go over uh, to get the patch delivered to the device. We can use this framework, adapt K patch, to quickly deliver the patches to the target phones. But there's still another uh, problem that is unsolved. Uh, this is the uh, capability mismatching. Right now, as I just said, we have to first gain root in order to collect some kernel information and in order to load the kernel module or to inject the binary code into the memory. So we have to exploit the vulnerabilities first in order to fix the vulnerabilities. So that's an un unstable solution because if you try to root in the first place, you may like crash the phone. So what if the vendor can cooperate with us 
So here goes again where uh, the, vend the phone vendors and the security vendors can uh, work together to fix, uh, to, to integrate the K Adapt K patch framework. So the vendor can pre integrate the uh, patching module into the kernel space. And in kernel space, the agent can do patch ver ver verification and auto adaption, patch execution, and even uh, some failover mechanism. For example, it can monitor the uh, the work of the hot patches. If it causes instability, it can undo the hot patches. But there's, there's still another issue is the uh, security of the patches. So we are proposing a framework where others can help the vendor to patch. But why should the vendor trust other vendors? For example, why Samsung should trust uh, another security vendor? So we, we, we should have a patch a codification and vetting process above this framework. So first, we should do vendor codification. In order to, to, uh, sh to form this uh, joint effort, one vendor must to pass the vendor codification process to join this, um, this uh, cooperation. And the second step is after you submit a patch, hot patch, you have to bypass, you have to pass the security vetting of all the vendors. And third, after the deployment of the patch, the user can rate the patch, like how stable it is, whether it has backdoors, uh, whether it can cause like uh, exploits, further exploits. But still, this is not like perfect solution. If you want to um, ensure the security of a binary, you have to go through a long vetting process. That takes probably weeks, so still it's not fast enough. So we are proposing another improved version of this, which is much better. We call it Lua K patch. It, ha it offers more flexibility, yet has more constraint, so that you don't have to go through the uh, uh, complicated rebu re rebuilding process. Ideally, the uh, mechanism should be powerful enough to block most threats. And then it should be agile enough for quick patch generation. But still it has to be like, uh, uh, restrictive enough so that you don't have to do uh, the strict rebuilding process to confine the damages. We call it Lua K patch because right now it is Lua implemented. But as a matter of fact, you can use any type safe language engine to implement it. A type safe and like dy dynamic language has the, uh, have, has the advantage that it, it is easy to update the patches. And it, it has a natural jail to confine the execution. And also, for most of the uh, type safe dynamic language, you don't have to worry about memory type uh, vulnerabilities like stack overflow. We chose we choose Lua because Lua is light, it's, a, it's a small, and it's a fast, and also it has uh, better integration with C, and also it has GC. Here is our design principles. Uh, our observation is that most of the, the majority of the vulnerabilities come from the input, uh, not enough validation on the input. So on the leftmost graph, you can see that a kernel function usually takes inputs from the arguments or in the middle of the function, it will call a copy from user to get inputs from the user land. If it fails to validate an input enough, like the middle graph shows, uh, if a malicious input comes in and it fails to validate the input, the CFG may be hijacked. So we call this like a pounds situation. And what if we do enough check on the uh, input interface? We can block all such kind of um, malicious input. Some may argue that not all of the kernel exploits happens uh, in this way. Some are actually risk conditions, etc. But we can use the same mechanism to block them. We can like detect such kind of situation in the function entry or in the middle of the function to see whether such kind of situation happens. Based on this observation, we have the following restrictions uh, in this Lua engine. In kernel, in kernel space Lua engine. So first, uh, the patch which is executed in the Lua engine, it can hook a target function's to entry. 
if this is not enough, it can also hook the uh, middle invocations where uh, condition code, conditional code is returned. By conditional code, we mean the uh, execution status. So for example, copy from user, it will return a true or false condition to indicate whether the ex execution is succeed or not. And in, in the first and second condition, the patch can read anything that can be read, uh, can be read, like registers, stacks, heaps, and code space, et cetera as long as it doesn't uh, reach the uh, invalid like, memory space to trigger the memory fault. But in the fourth rule, we, we forbid any write, so no write by the patches. It cannot like, send data out as well. After, re after, gener after judging based on the read inputs, it can return an error code, like this is malicious or not. To get a more concrete like uh, understanding, we use an example here. So the function called fun, it calls two uh, functions called foo and bar. Foo function returns the execution code, status code. If it, it is failed, it will return the invalid like status code. So th in this kind of situation, we, we call foo is a satisfied sub invocations. So we allow the pass to hook foo, but for bar, we don't allow the patch to hook it because the return value is not used as a conditional check. It's used as like the uh, callback invocation. Based on the uh, aforementioned algorithm, we implement the Lua K patch based on the uh, Lua engine. It's roughly 11K thousand of uh, code and 600 lines of code are the core patching logic. Uh, after compiling it, it we, get a, we got a 800 KB kernel module, which is quite small. Uh, we can just uh, load it ahead of time by integrating it into the vendor's firmware, or we can root the phone by load this like afterwards. We provide the following capability interfaces. The first one is a symbol searching. You give a symbol to it, it can search the address of the symbol. And after getting the address of the, of the symbol, you can hook, hook the address. And you can do type the reading by reading any memory space with the type. And also we feed thread information into the uh, patch so that it can see which thread it is in. Here is an example of the patch. So the kpatcher function, Lua function is a callback that will be called after uh, the function execute, the target function executes in the, in the hook point. And in, this, uh, in the 14th line, you can see that we search the symbol field text uh, which is a tower root vulnerable function. And in the last line, it try to hook this function. In this case, if field text is executed, it will uh, call back to the kpatcher handler. The kpatcher uh, handler will try to judge uh, from the in registers from the stack. Uh, in this case, it is the two uh, parameters one is called U address one, the other one is U address two. Uh, it will check whether the two par parameters are equal. If they're equal, it is a tower root exploit uh, condition. Then it will return an error. Our framework, uh, after our framework see this error returning, we'll, we will know that there is an exploit condition. We will not execute it into the field text queue function that triggered the exploit. We will just like return the error code for field text queue just like it fails to execute. We tested this framework on many CVEs as well. So you can see that almost all the famous CVEs uh, have been tested through. Some are easy to defend against. Uh, they can just put a check on the function entry. But others uh, need to also hook the middle invocation of the function, like the highlighted ones. Usually the, uh, the middle hooked invocations are copied from user. But you can see that most of them are easy to, to be fixed just by checking on the function entry. Well, we can give two examples. Uh, the first one is uh, the CVE 2013-1763. Uh, uh, this is the source code of the patch. We can just uh, do the uh, function entry check uh, to achieve the same check, to achieve the same validation. 
And the second example of is CBE 2013-6123. Uh, so this, this situation is quite uh, complicated. Uh, you can see that from the right hand side uh, patch, it has to uh, rely a check on something that is obtained from the user space. So this is the second like, uh, type of the fix that we just uh, described. So we have to hook the copy from user to check the uh, uh, input from the user, user space as well. So here is another quick demo to show this kind of uh, solution. So we use dual mobile, another security, security vendors tool called X-Ray on Android to scan the vulnerabilities on the device. So this app will actually try to exploit the phone uh, to see how many vulnerabilities are exploitable. So here you can see that it finds that the ping pong root and tower root vulnerabilities exist on this phone. Then we launch Lua K patch. We also found the two uh, kernel vulnerabilities. And we click the one button, protect me. We load the Lua uh, function into the kernel space to do the proper check. And then we go back to the X-ray to scan the phone again. Uh, there are other vulnerabilities in user space. We didn't fix them, so you can see they're still vulnerable. But for these two kernel vulnerabilities, the ping pong root and tower root, it is no longer vulnerable. So they, they got properly fixed. And you can see from the process, the fixing uh, period is actually quite short. We we'll just click one button and bam, it's just got fixed. But how fast it is as for the uh, normal execution, we just we, we, we tested the performance by uh, CF Bench. So you can see that uh, the leftmost bar is the uh, base. It's a normal condition where no patch is loaded. And the right three bars are situations where we uh, pass the tower root, pass the ping pong root, and pass the both uh, vulnerabilities. You can see that the performance is not like impacted at all. There, there are these tiny deviations. Uh, that's because CF bench, uh, the score is not stable. If you run it multiple times, it will get different score. We ran 20 times for each case and got the average, but still there is a tiny uh, deviation. This is, this is a reasonable result because usually the uh, severe kernel vulnerabilities usually happens on the code path that usually you cannot reach. If you frequently reach such kind of a path, it should be like detected by security researchers like many years ago. But still, we're interested if we load patches on the hot code path. What if the code path that has Lua patched is frequently invocated? Here we use the uh, syscall change mode as an example. If you just execute this syscall on Nexus 5 with Android 4.4, it takes 100.7 micro microseconds. Uh, to, to finish the execution. But if we pass this, uh, this call with a uh, Lua K patch with different kind of uh, logic, like you can do a direct return, you can do conditional comparison, you can do memory read, and you can do like complicated combination of, of operations. But all such kind of conditions only generate uh, below four microseconds overhead. So that's only 4% 4 4 of a change mode this call which is pretty like negligible. In the worst situation, uh, we got the, uh, if we want to hook a frequently called syscall, like get time of the day, uh, this syscall will get called on the uh, 100,000 times uh, order on the Nexus 5 uh, phone. Uh, even on this extreme condition, if we hook all those invo invocations, it only generates uh, under 1% uh, overhead. So which is quite small. And furthermore, as an ongoing work, we will replace Lua engine with Lua JIT or BPF JIT. That should be even faster. So in the world, we propose the two uh, solutions, the Adapt k -Pass and Lua k -Pass. But our ultimate goal is not only to propose the framework itself. We want to use the framework to build an ecosystem for the 
all the vendors to join together to fix the issues that we just described. So based on Lua K patch, the vendors can fix problems in days, probably it was just one to two days. And for if some problem cannot be fixed by Lua K patch, because since we put a uh, so strict rule on the patches, uh, you can fall back to the adapt K patch. If uh, in this case you have still have to go through the uh, the vetting patch vetting process, so in this case it have to take weeks to get the problem fixed, but still it is faster than the traditional code patch. So based on the workflow that we listed in the above slides, we can got a joint effort from the from the overall uh, ecosystem. So why should we have the combination of the effort? because the kernel vulnerabilities are getting more and more and more and more complicated. So a joint effort means more and more forces can help to, to generate patches to tackle the vulnerabilities. And in the adapt k patch scheme, patches can be vetted to be more secure if there's more vendors here to vet the, the patches. And last but mo most importantly, all the vendors can join together to, to establish a standard so as Lang just, just said, we have already got a severe fragmented ecosystem of Android. We don't want to get another layer of fragmentation of patching. So suppose we propose the uh, live patching framework here today. If, if different vendors uh, implement it in a different way, uh, we, can, we can get different uh, solutions. The patches should be deployed uh, to fit into different kind of channels. So that's, this is another layer of fragmentation. So we don't want, want that to happen. So here we call for the joint effort into this ecosystem to build a standard of hot patching. And for more details, you can refer to our white papers. And that's all about our presentation. So thanks a lot. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. So there is an open mic in the aisle. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I have a question. So so this is live patching, right? And uh, do you take care of the case when the phone has already been looted or has already been compromised in some way and modified the uh, information that you are collecting at the the first stage? Uh, no, so, no, th th this is not in our stream model. Yeah, but uh, I think uh, uh, our solution will help users to, you know, to after removing the bad guys and uh, protect the, the 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 device. But uh, but we don't uh, consider such you know such an adversary now. Okay, I cannot okay. really hear that. <laughs> it's fine. It's okay. Um, I understand you're at the beginning of your, your journey yet, but there are certain things such as rollback protection, real-time kernel protection, integrity measurement architecture, which rely on entire setup of hashes and, you know, signatures on the image. And during an auto update, we consider this. What will happen, what do you think about it will happen when you do it in a partial patch operation? You have a roadmap for that, at least. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question again? <laughs> so uh, there are certain uh, security mechanisms, such as integrity measurement architectures, yes. mm -hmm. such as real-time kernel protection, yes. and so on. And uh, when you partially update, you basically break a hash tree or a chain of uh, security mechanisms. So uh, what is the roadmap for these? What do oh, you yeah. think? How, how could it be solved without actually generating as much time that you consume with the over-the-air update? Okay, well, that's a good question. So we are actually working with other vendors on this right now. So right now, you can see that there have already been some kernel integrity dynamic protection in the kernel space, right? But they, can, they are not the uh, silver bulletin. Uh, they are not silver bullet. So they cannot well solve the current root, root problems. So we cannot just rely on the integration dynamic protection. So as you said, so what if such kind of solution exists, but they, on one hand, they cannot tackle the problem. On the other hand, they blocks our dynamic like memory modification. 
So in this kind of situation, we either should pass the kernel to whitelist our operations, or the vendor can cooperate to just open the interface for us uh, to do the passion work. And of course, they have to do the authentication authorization so that only the legitimate operations are allowed. And uh, there's also the question of how to manage the keys for these operations, because you have to obviously sign your patch and so on, and you are dependent on the vendor again in this case. You have to give your key or you have to take their key and so on and so on. Um, doesn't it also add some uh, overhead to the operations? Uh, that's a, another good question. So right now our design is that when the third party vendors submit the patch, they have to sign the patches. And when the phone vendor takes the patch, they have to do sign the patch. Only the patch that can be uh, verifi ver verified uh, by both vendors uh, can be loaded into the kernel memory to be executed. Uh, your question is whether this generates another uh, performance overhead, right? So first of all, uh, Kernel space has already has implemented many cryptography uh, functionalities just to do such kind of like uh, functionalities, like to 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 ver verify signatures of kernel modules. So this was by design or in, uh, already uh, integrated functionality. And second, uh, we only do this on the patch loading process. It does not happen like, all the time. It just happens when we do the patch load the patch. So it will not like, significantly hurt the user experience. Thank you. So uh, my, my question is, um, basically you have at least 20, 25 vendors that you have to work with at the very minimum in order to do this for the majority of the uh, devices that are out there. Um, right now, what's, what percentage of those vendors are actually interested in talking to you about this? Because it fundamentally depends on them <laughs> buying into it. And then what has been the biggest um, resistance that they've had in terms of telling you that no, they won't do this? Mm, yeah, and, yeah and, uh, we, we just announced such a, you know, a solution and uh, now we are called for cooperation. So we, we, we are, you know, after standardizing the framework, we will yeah, ask uh, when they run by what, yeah. Not yet approach the vendor yes, to try yes. to get them to participate. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I think that's all. Thank you again.